I'd like to talk today about a little bit of software development techniques and challenges that have existed ever since the 1970s when software development first became a discipline. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is define a couple words. First, a methodology is a system of methods in a particular area of study or activity. So agile would be a methodology. Scrum would be a, an agile method. In other words, agile meaning the methodology where the method itself would be Scrum. So Scrum is a particular procedure for accomplishing the process of doing an agile software development. Now, this is one of my favorite people. His name is Scott Ambler. He basically said, I believe that many people have lost sight of the fact that the primary goal of software development is to build systems in the most efficient and effective manner possible that meets the needs of the users. What he's saying here is that a lot of times we get wrapped up in this idea where we've got to create this document that the next thing on the schedule is to get this document created. Does the document actually help us create the software? Well, no, it's a non-value added activity. It doesn't add a bit of code to the system. It doesn't deploy a system. It doesn't benefit the user, but we document our systems. Well, is it effective to document your systems at the beginning when you know the least about the system? Well, Scott Ambler would go on to say, no, that is not the case. Documenting the system when you have finished the system, of course, is very necessary in order to maintain the system. But trying to write the entire requirements document at the beginning is non it can be non-value added in a lot of respects. So let's talk about why there's this idea of trying to do all these things when we can't really hit the mark in getting it done properly, where we try to document a, a software system when we don't know much about the system at all. Writing down the requirements is one thing. Trying to document every little form and report and everything that goes with the system may not be the most effective way to do it. In fact, it's been proven not to be. So what we want to deal with is the fact that there's a lot of waste in a the process of software development. So why is that? Let's explore. The history of software development is a is a problem of cost overruns, delayed releases, and features that are less than, less than expected. In other words, a lot of times you'll get to a point in a project where it's already over cost based on all the documentation that you did at the very beginning, the schedule that you wrote at the very beginning, and the estimate of cost that you wrote at the very beginning before knowing all the things that you were going to stumble over as things went on. So in 1956, we've got the first software development method coming out called StageWise, and it was basically a waterfall process. You documented everything, then you designed it, then you wrote the code, then you tried to deploy it classical waterfall like, like Winston Royce seemed to postulate in his 1970 paper uh, came out, of course, in 1970. We continue to move forward and the first real iterative sort of agile method we come to is Spiral that came along in 1980. Now Spiral wrote, um, wrote gets its name from writing a, a spiral type of notation in the respect that it would start with design and then go through the regular waterfall method, but it would do it with a small portion of the project. Then it would also start the next piece of it and they would start off, but the first piece would already be in the design phase or later phases, but they would be focusing on small enough pieces that they would in fact be able to work through those pieces easier. So the idea of Spiral was to break it up into several different pieces of the project and work on those separately. Now I worked on a project that used the Spiral method back in the 90s and basically it was a modified waterfall. They took a small piece, ran it through waterfall. They took another piece and ran it through the waterfall. And you know, 
it was only as effective as waterfall ever is. It always ran cost overruns. Things would go from one spiral push to the next because they couldn't accomplish it in the time frame. And it, the cost overruns, of course, were still the same. So while Spiral had a good idea trying to get this iterative sort of pattern going, it really didn't do anything to advance the world of Agile. Okay, so Objectory started coming out. That was just more focused on object-oriented programming. Um, so it really didn't advance things. The first real advance we have is when Scrum started being experimented with and rapid application or, or RAD in 1980, 1990, I mean, Scrum and RAD were, were basically an idea that we'll build the software first and let you see it. In other words, rapid application development was high on prototyping. They built a quick prototype and let you see what was happening and then they elicited a response from the customer that would allow that customer to give feedback early and give feedback often as you continue to build the software. The criticism of Brad was that you ended up with software that was thrown over the fence but had very little documentation. So management hated the idea of Brad simply because there was never documentation to maintain it after you, after the programmers left and the project was done. So RAD was given a black eye simply because there wasn't a focus on documentation. So you continue on with adaptive software development, which was the same people that developed RAD were the same were um, developing adaptive software development, and because of that, it had kind of the same problems, but it was a little bit more advanced extreme programming came on in about 1995. And so you see the rational unified process in 1998, pro pragmatic programming in 2000. But then you have something really radical happening. We've got extreme programming being, being played around with. We've got Scrum being advanced in the 1990 to 1995 range. But then you have people getting together in Utah and trying to hammer out really the direction that software development should take. And they come out with the Agile Manifesto. Now the Agile Manifesto was really a huge advance in software development because it recognized that we're not building a bridge. We're not building a building. We're not um, hiring union laborers that did a certain amount of electrical in a certain period of time or plumbers that did a certain amount of plumbing in a certain period of time. We were hiring creative people who had varying talents and varying abilities, creating a creative project. For example, you probably would never have tried to um, hold Michelangelo to a particular budget or a particular time frame when creating the painting of the Sistine Chapel. It, the thought is just ridiculous. So why do we try to restrict or put on a schedule people who create software? We have this whole idea where they want to get rid of the waterfall method because they know over the many years so far that the waterfall method has been an abject failure. It causes cost overruns, it causes cost uh, schedule overruns. Uh, by the end, everybody's so frustrated with it. A lot of times they'll just cut out features to get the project done. So it's not what you expected at the end. The waterfall is generally an abject failure. And unfortunately, Winston Royce is the one that got credited with creating waterfall, even though he said, if you can read the small print, I believe in this concept of the implementation described above invites failure. Okay, so even Winston Rice said that waterfall was never going to really work. And really the key here is that managers just don't understand. Like, for example, you've got a finance manager who's attuned to project management, but project management to a finance person is taught that you start with a design, you start with a budget, you start with a schedule, and then you start developing the project. Project management for finance is not the same as project management for software development. 
So let's, uh, let's move on and look at what the Agile Manifesto came up with. First off, they believe that individuals are more, and interactions are more important than processes and tools. In other words, we're going to be more concerned with the individuals who want the software and conversing with them than we are over a certain process, waterfall process, or certain tools that have to have certain documentation and such. We prefer working software over gobs of documentation and no working software. We prefer to collaborate with the customers over negotiating a contract at the beginning with a certain price tag and a certain schedule and a certain uh, set of features. And of course, the first thing you do is throw that over the fence to the, the customer. They're saying, I don't want to pay that much. You got to cut the price in half. Well, which features do you want to cut? I'm none. I don't want to cut any features out. So it becomes this big contract negotiation. Well, what you need to do is you need to let the creative people be creative and they'll generally come up with it faster and better than what you could have gotten if you had this huge contract or schedule or cost negotiated up front. Then responding to change rather than following a plan. Meaning we're going to respond to corrections in our understanding all along the way versus following the plan that we negotiated in this main contract up, in, up front where the schedule was all laid out and the features were all laid out and where the way that we were going to do it was all way, laid out at the very beginning. We're going to let discovery dominate rather than following this plan when we hadn't yet discovered the challenges with that plan. So they value, what they tried to say is they valued everything on the right, but they valued the large type on the left more than what was on the right. Now these were the people who were the people who signed the Agile Manifesto. And what you'll see is that a lot of these people came from various disciplines like so Crystal was created by Alastair Coburn. Then you go on to Extreme Programming created by Ken Beck. Now remember, Kent Beck created Extreme Programming kind of before the Agile Manifesto. So he was already playing with an Agile type of development process um, before the Agile Manifesto came out. Then you had a couple other people who were playing with Extreme Programming with him, Ward Cunningham and Ron Jeffries. Scrum, we had three people involved with Scrum from 1995 to 2000, uh, Beetle, Ken Schwaber, and Jeff Sutherland. Then you had Jim Highsmith working with RAD and the adaptive software development that we talked about. So the Agile methodology, if we take all of the methods that are comprised in that methodology, they consist of a series of tiny projects. It aims for high customer satisfaction through early and continuous delivery of useful pieces of software so that they can go through an iterative process of both delivery and communication with the user to continue providing more and more feedback. Like Lean, they don't want to do anything more than they need to do at any particular time before it needs to be done. So they'll wait and document more later than earlier. They'll document requirements and desires, user stories, for example, before they start developing, but they won't develop full documentation until toward the end of the project. Rapid application was very similar in the respect that they prototyped smaller scale representations. So in this way, it was a lot a lot the precursor of the Agile methodologies that came later. Extreme programming also had the same sort of iterative sort of waterfall happening at the same time, but they were breaking it into smaller pieces. And at the end of each iteration, they were able to actually implement each small piece. So they, they chopped it into implementable pieces of the software so that by the time they're done, they're delivering useful software. And then Scrum, 
um, breaks uh, the project into small teams that are deliverable, usually sprints of two weeks to 30 day intervals. They uh, wanted to achieve a, an appointed goal. Each day ends and begins with a stand-up meeting. And the reason it's a stand-up is because it's meant to be short, a quick report, a quick request for help, a quick chance to just touch base and then get to work. Back to the beginning. How do we reduce this waste in software development? The one big challenge is that there's bureaucracy and inefficient processes built in to most software development. The challenge though, is that even if you want to implement an agile method, you've got managers who don't understand what it is to work in an agile method. And because they don't understand how, to, how an agile method works, they're going to start relying on their reports. Their reports are going to tell, are you ahead or behind the schedule? Are you on as far as your cost? And if they're going to insist on getting absolute reports of why you're late or why you're on time or what the budget is, you are getting roadblocks in your project, project already. So how do you overcome those roadblocks? And the way to overcome the roadblocks is through transformational leadership. In other words, you've got to train your people who you're developing the software for in order to help them understand what Agile is and what they can expect from the project along the way so that they can receive what they expect and not what they've been trained to receive when you're building a building or a bridge or something physical where you can really plan things out. You have to train your leaders to be able to understand those deliverables along the way. So I took and I examined this issue with 30 experts from Fortune 500 companies. And the study was basically say, what are the obstacles to actually implementing Lean or Agile software in your companies? And then how does a leader overcome those obstacles to actually adopt Lean or Agile principles? Just to give you an idea of why I wanted to find out these questions simply is because I, I worked at Boeing and why was Boeing having a hard time with not doing projects in waterfall? I worked on one project that was twice the total cost by the time it was done, literally, and was three years past when it was first promised that it would be delivered. These are abject failures. It, companies don't like to pay twice as much, nor do they like to take more than twice the amount of time to deliver product that you actually expected to be delivered. So how do you get to the point where you aren't trying to call in your project managements for an hour meeting at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day to report what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it so that you can get back on track? Well, how do you expect a project manager to get back on track if you're taking two hours out of his day? It doesn't really make sense unless you don't understand Agile. So what the study did was it identified those barriers. It identified why those barriers existed and figured out what kind of leadership attributes were necessary to overcome those barriers. And what I found out was this. You have to establish a strong vision of lean software development. You have to help those managers understand the benefits of lean or agile software development. You then have to build trust with the employees. Waterfalls don't develop trust. Waterfalls develop a, situ a system where they expect to have a document. And if they follow exactly what the document says, then they can stand behind that document and say, but that's what the requirements said. So that's what you got. I don't really care if it's wrong. In fact, I had a situation where the project was put together and the, um, the functional analyst that was taking down all the requirements and delivering them to IT basically said, if a field is blank, then do this. So the programmer, the, the user said, if it's blank, do this. 
the functional analyst interpreted that as if the field is null, do this. The problem is they really meant blank. They really meant if it's null, okay. If it has only a space in it or no value in it, but it's not technically null as far as a database is concerned, still do that same action. And the programmer argued with us on that one little point, and we had to take it all the way up the management chain to get the person to not require us to put in a change request after the program was implemented in order to make that little change because the FA used the word null when the user really meant that if there's not any one of these values in there, respond this way. So you've got to be able to empower your employees. You've got to build robust communication and not manage by documentation and negotiation along the way. You've got to build healthy teams of project managers who are willing to work with the customers so that they can give that feedback back and forth. And if you do all those things, you can actually implement an agile software method. Without these things, your project will may start out as lean or may start out as agile, but ultimately will end up in a waterfall situation where managers, because they don't understand how to deal with this creative thing called software development, they will revert you right back to what they understand, which is how to build a building or how to build a bridge and expect it all to be documented and costed out and scheduled out and if you don't meet cost and schedule, then we want more and more and more meetings. We want more meetings in order for you to tell us why and what you're going to do to get back on plan. And can we give you more help? And all of those questions that come with a project that's beginning to fail. So if you like what you heard here, uh, please hit that like button and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Yeah.